let's dive into the story. I, I'd love to talk about that that, okay. that backstory, yep. of, of, to even right back to the school. Yeah, I think that's I think that's a really interesting component. It's like what were, sure. you, what were you like in in you know in high school? Yeah, we'll, we'll continue to progress the journey for sure. So high school for me. So I went to a public school. Yep. Normal kid, lots of friends. In your local area? Yeah, oh, further north than where I live now. Yep. So yeah, so where I grew up, Warnervale, at the time it wasn't overly as developed as it is now, but you know, a couple of, couple of little schools around. Um, when I went to school, we just moved up from Sydney. Yes. Um, we went to a, I went to a primary school locally and then just obviously moved on to the high school. Yep. Just wasn't for me. I started a lot younger than most of the other kids, so I would have been probably 18 months younger than a lot of my mates. So that's already hard. Just, you're so easily influenced as a young male let alone being a younger male. So I was just always the stupid kid doing dumb things at the, at the worst times. So if it was throwing a ball off a balcony and just happening to be the guy who hit the teacher, if it was you know throwing things around the classroom, if it was not showing up for class, just things that you do when you're young. Yep. For me, I think school was never gonna work. I'm not someone who can sit there and study and, and you know take things away and want, like if, if I'm not focused, 100% committed to something, it, it has no interest to me. I'm all in on the things I'm all in on, but the things that I'm not, they're just, yeah. So for me, it was like, okay, school's not working, I've got to get out of here. So by about 16, I'd sort of figured that it's not working. What year was that in school? Oh, nine or 10? Yeah, okay. I think I think I did the year 10 HSC. Yep. Yeah, okay. yeah. But again, didn't do great. It was just doing it because the school allowed me to come and do it and finish it off and then get out of there. Yep. Um, and then, you know, it was sort of a mutual agreement with, with a lot of the people at the school that they just knew that it wasn't for me and it probably wasn't fair to either of us for me to continue to disrupt the classes and, and other people. And as well for myself, I was just getting no self-interest. No, nothing was motivating me to be there. Yep. So I moved on from there. At the time, I was actually working at McDonald's. So um, I was day, I think I was night crew member yep. for all the way through school, like most people. So yeah, a couple of days a week you were working. Yeah, so just school. just at 14, like everyone, yeah. saving for a car, you awesome. know. So at McDonald's every single afternoon after work, and you'd work through. That was probably what spurred on, if I'm really honest, me not wanting to be at school. Yeah. I really loved being around, like mates at work and different people and different cultures and a fast paced environment and somewhere where you're making money yeah. and anyone who's ever worked at McDonald's knows that you get paid peanuts <laughs> to begin with <laughs> yeah. you know I was getting paid nothing but I loved it because yeah. it was it was my chance to earn something for myself it like creates almost like a sense of freedom because yeah. it's like the money yep. in your bank account you're starting to how good is it oh, yeah, how good is yeah. it you're getting paid yeah. you're hanging out with friends you're learning you're doing all this sort of stuff and I think the other part of it was it was good to have something that you could progress in you know so it was like in school, you're either really good at it and you're smart and you're learning and you're getting better, you know, in an educational sense. Yes. But there's not really many accolades that come with that other than, you know, maybe being the ducks of the school. Yeah. Where for me, it was going back to, you know, when you're at McDonald's, you could, you could be the best in a department. Yep. You could then be the, you know, the best within the restaurant. You could be one of the best supervisors, managers, whatever. Yeah. So I thought there's got to be a way I can, you know, try and channel this. So I, I tried to manage both school and, and working out like, like at McDonald's obviously after yep. school. I ended up just, as I said, calling quits on school. Yep. Ended up speaking to the restaurant manager who's now like one of my best mates. We've, we've been friends for, I don't know, it'd have to be about 10, 11 years because yeah. I've known him since I was 14. Yeah. And so I spoke to him. Mum was obviously gutted that, you know, didn't finish school and just you know, a bit of a letdown. Yeah. Just doing silly things. So I ended up speaking with him and I said, look, you know, I'd really love to come and work for your day crew. He said, well, I'm not going to let you go and waste your life just hanging out at home and doing nothing since you're yeah. not at school. So he gave me a start at day crew. And day crew is just, you know, you get all the good hours. You, yeah. You're there early, like 5, 6 a.m. starts, yeah. brekkie shifts all the way through. Yeah, right. So long and the short of it, worked my way up at Macca's. By the time I was 18, I was yeah. a restaurant manager. Awesome. Which was cool. I thought, oh, sorry, 16, I was a restaurant manager. Yeah, right. So at 16, and I was one of the youngest in Australia, which was just cool. They, they probably shouldn't have promoted me in terms of, I don't think it was so much agreed with by head office, but they did it anyway. Yeah. And then I, you know, because of that respect, I wanted to try and make them proud. So worked my guts out and then that would have been two years. By the time I was 18, change of ownership with McDonald's parted ways. From there, I just, I'd resigned, went into a golf shop. Yep. And okay. when I started working there, knew nothing about golf. Yep. So there was about 200 candidates. I went in for this interview and I 200 thought- 200 candidates? Yeah, I know, crazy, crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah. Is it because like the, the, it not, there's not many opportunities around? No opportunities yeah, for something right. like that. Because for, for most golf shops, yep. they're, like, they're predominantly either looking for golfers or yep. someone with a golf background or, or something wow. industry based. I knew nothing. Yep. I'd never played, never picked up a club. And anyway, I just liked the idea of it. I thought, well, this looks pretty cool. So I went in and, and got the job there. Loved it. 
got hooked on golf. Anyone who's ever played golf, yeah. like who's been passionate about it, yeah. once you've been bitten by the golf bug, that's it. You're, you're done. So yeah. that was pretty well it. Just absolutely hooked on it, and yeah. you know, work there every day. The, the yeah, thought what was process. The role there, sorry. So that the role is like it was so it was golf shop assistant. So you yeah, sort of work cool. in. You're doing similar stuff to like what a trainee pro might do. So yep. it's things like, you know, looking after members in yep. terms of helping book tea times, yep. sorting out golf carts, yep. um, so all that sort of stuff. A bit of that continuing of the customer service. Yeah, yeah, selling stuff in the shop. Yep. And anyway, like, you know, got better at golf and enjoyed it, but thought, you know, I, I definitely don't have what it takes to become a golf pro. Yep. And, you know, there's guys at 16 who are better than me now. There's no way it's going to work out. Yep. So I went, you know what, I'm like, I like golf and I love it, but I'll keep it as a hobby. One of the big things that I loved in the shop was selling the stock. Yeah. Geez, I could sell the new drivers, you know, and geez, I could sell a golf shirt. It was unbelievable. But it was never so much about, you know, pushing a product. It was just about getting to know people, figuring out what, you know, what probably makes them click and what, yep. that I, you know, what I can offer them. So I went through it that way and, and that, that worked out pretty well. On my, it would have been my, about my two year anniversary, yep. I was just starting to be to the point where you get sick of selling Mars bars. Yeah. And I thought, gosh, there's gotta be something else out there. And I'd met a couple of real estate agents just in passing. And I thought, you know what, these guys seem like they, they've got a pretty comfortable lifestyle in terms of they've, they've got you know, good money, they're well off, they seem well educated, they seem like they've got a bit more freedom and space. So I thought, this is something I could really get into. So I spoke to a couple of the guys just whilst I was in the shop and I was like, yeah, I'm going all in, I love it. So I ended up ringing one particular member who was like, yep, I could give you a job. He owns a real estate agency at the entrance. He's like, yep, there's something I can line up for you. I thought, how good would this be? So just on a promise, I went, you know what? I'm just gonna quit my job. <laughs> this sounds good. It was my two year anniversary. We just had the cake. Congratulations on two years at Magenta. And I went, thanks, I quit. This has been great. You guys have been awesome. I gotta go, I gotta get out of here. So I did, I resigned and, and it was, it was the strangest feeling because it was just like no idea what I'm chasing after. And for anyone who's ever left school or even been in school, that overwhelming sense of not knowing what you're going to do with your life, like as a career, isn't that just the worst yeah. thing ever? I can't even imagine going through that again because I, I, like, it was my worst nightmare. Yeah. So real estate had to work because I just couldn't think of going to find another job. You know, like most people, you sit there and think, am I going to be a tradie? Am I going to go and you know get into more of a, um, like a, business-based role, something like that, that just for me wasn't it. So yeah. ended up taking this promise and I thought, okay, this is great. I'm on my way and I rang him probably the first week after I quit because he said, just take a week, just drift, give me a ring. I rang him, I said, mate, I'm ready. He said, oh, come into the office, we'll have a bit of a chat and we'll go from there. Came into the office, did some work experience. I went away and rang him back and I said, mate, I'm ready to start. And he goes, oh, look, ah, the market's just tough. We'll bring you on soon. Just hang out another month. He did that for three months. Yeah. So for three months, and keep in mind, as I said, I, w I was at McDonald's and as a restaurant manager, so you know, at 16, you're earning like a thousand bucks a week, which is good money at that Perfect, age. Yeah. And then after that, I think, you know, at Magenta, it would have been about the same, maybe a touch better. Yeah. So you start to live to that wage. Yeah. So I, you know, I had a, a new car, nothing worth writing home about, but the repayments were still 170 a week, yeah. still having to pay petrol, insurance, all that sort of stuff, bills, right? Yeah. So I still had bills. So three months without work, I was just like, what can I do to help make myself some money? The real estate dream had just gone. I was like, yeah, that's not happening. He's brushed me and I'm gonna have to sort something pretty oh. quick. So for me, it was like, okay, what do we do? So I live where I was, as I said, further north, so Warnerville. Yep. I live on a like a road, Sparks Road, just off there. And Sparks Road's like the main point to getting on the freeway. So there's a lot of like a lot of trucks and traffic and things like that that goes up that way. So I just took, you know, took my phone up, went over there and just started writing down the phone numbers of all the traders that drove past. And I would just cold call. No and way. I'd just say, Hey, I just saw you drive past, my name's Matt. Um, I'd love to come and do a day's landscaping with you. No He's way. like, Oh mate, we're not hiring. No, no, I don't want a job. I just need a day's labour. And so I, I would like I, I would literally do it for next to nothing. It was just about trying to get enough to pay the bills. I'd be living at home, and it was like it was things like um, you know I think I did landscaping, I did marine detailing, I did um, a bit of brickwork, yeah. anything, anything I can do to get some money. I love that. Yeah. <laughs> so so by about month three, I, I sort of thought, okay, this is too much. I'm sick of this. I just want something. I just want to lock it in. I got invited to go and hang out with some friends and they were heading out to, to the beer garden. So the beer garden in Terrigal, um, you have to still go through a lot of the coastal suburbs that I never really ventured to. I spent a lot of time in that Warnerville area and if you're there, you're 45 minutes from Terrigal to give you some context. Yeah, right. And then Warnerville, you know, if you're going to beaches and things like that, you're going to Nora's Beach, uh, Nora Head Beach or Soldiers Beach, anything like that. So as you start going up the coastline, obviously you start passing through some different suburbs, which I now work in. Yes. Um, but one of the suburbs in particular, so I came through Womberall and Terrigal, and I remember looking at this signboard for this house, and I'd never been to this area as a, as a teenager sort of thing, so I hadn't taken much notice of what was out there. Yes. And we drove past this house and I thought, 
pull over. This is unreal. So I've gone and had a look at it and it was 10 to 12 Ocean View, I still remember it. It was this double block, unbelievable sized home on the lagoon. Just beautiful, I still remember the shot. Yeah. You know, it was the living room with the green pool table opening out onto the lagoon <laughs> with the tennis court and I was like, how can he sell these kind of houses? Yeah. I'd love to sell these houses. So was that on the signboard, sorry? It's on signboard. Yeah, it's on signboard. So anyone says signboards don't sell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I beg to differ. Yeah, yeah. So when someone pushes that point with me, I yeah. go, hang about, yeah, I've got a story yeah. for you. Yeah. Not so long, but. Um, so anyway, I, I just, I thought, you know what? I've cold called all these, tra like these yeah. tradies. Just pull your socks up, make the phone call. Yeah. So I, I rang the, the principal or the listing agent, which was Tim, who's still my principal today. Awesome. And I just rang him out of the blue and I said, look, Tim, my name's Matt. I know you don't know me. I'm going to tell you a quick story about how I've just been shafted yeah. and what I think I can offer and why I want a job. And I just said, I'm looking at the listings that you're selling yeah. and I'd like to sell those listings. Oh, I'd like a job, please. Yes. He goes, oh, it's not really how it works. Why not? <laughs> he goes, well, there's an interview process. We've actually got to be hiring and we really don't have any jobs going. I said, I'll work for nothing. It really doesn't matter. Just get me in the door. And he's like, oh, look, you sound like a great guy. I'm sorry about what happened. How about this? Meet with my business manager. If you get through Catherine and things go well, We'll talk. Yeah. Met with Catherine, it went well. Again, yeah. no resume, I've never really been that style of person. And, yeah. and after just hiring, I can honestly say to anyone who's going through that, resumes are the worst thing you can do. Don't yeah. waste your time. Yeah. If you're gonna do something, like be a bit different. Yeah. Film yourself. Yeah. Mate, I've sifted through that many applications and you know what the number one thing I was thinking? Do they have the same energy as me? Do they, do they, do they appear? nicely are they you know are they someone I can get a bit of a vibe from can't you can't get that out of a resume yeah, no. so that aside I, I ended up just you know I went going in with her met with her it went well yep. and then Tim just agreed to meet with me we went for a drive in the car and we're just chatting he said you know what Matt he's like I don't have a job for you and I can't offer much but we're gonna take you on and you're just gonna do everything yes. so I went you know what this is unreal and for me that was that was what I did it was just full immersion in the role I was everything to everyone it yeah. didn't matter what it was right. I was happy to be the sign boy happy to be the shit kicker it really didn't matter and I think to a lot of the a lot of the younger guys who are out there now play the long game 100% yep. play the long game like I would be putting out um, letterbox drops for Harry. I'd be putting pointer signs out for Tim at 5 a.m. And I did that all the way up until last year. Really? Yeah, I've been putting pointer signs out for forever. I've been Thanks doing my own it. letterbox drops. Like, yeah, still doing all that stuff. Still fold my own letters because yeah. like that's the process stuff that just keeps you grounded, keeps you humble, keeps you understanding and hungry as to what, you know, what it takes. So just went through that process of just trying to be everything to everyone. And then from there, like, everything's just lined up. Like it hasn't all been smooth sailing yeah. and it hasn't all been, there's definitely times like all real estate agents sit there and go, nah, not cut out for this, it's not working, not yeah. comfortable, not happy, but yeah, it's been unreal. Awesome. It's been, a, it's been a cool journey. Yeah, it's really, really good, I love that. Um, I wanna just, so, because obviously we discussed prior, but I do yeah. wanna just touch on what those steps were before you got into the sales role. Yeah. So like what those little like little bits that got you there to the sales role now. For sure. So it started out originally doing leasing. So that was sort of the first role. Yep. So as I said, I was, I was actually, oh no, sorry, started out doing sales support because I got the job with Tim. Yep. And so it was just cold calling actually. Okay. So the first job was, you know, Tim's been in, in our area since I was born, I'd say, yeah. or pretty close yeah. to. He's done it for 30 years in, in that particular area. Yeah. And anyway, the database is long spanning. So yeah. the, the initial task, he was like, I just want you to call through every single year's database starting yeah. from like 94. It's a strange conversation to have. Yeah, you yeah. came through an open home in 94. I just wanted to see if you're still <laughs> looking or if you bought. Horrendous. So that was just the coldest calls imaginable. And yeah. you know what, if anything, it made me so comfortable on the phone because yes. making those calls, especially when you don't have any experience in a room full of sales agents and in. assistants all listening uh -huh. in and you just, every call you make, you're sweating. Yeah. And you can yeah. feel it. And you just, you're going, please be disconnected. Please be disconnected. <laughs> and then they answer and you go, oh boy, I've got to say something here. I'm in a lot of trouble. So like, there's no quicker way to learn. That's trial by fire. Was you know? there, was there um, when you got there, like did, did the business you're in have like scripts and dialogues? Or no, is the no. Is a bit looser? Welcome something? to real estate. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like most people, it was just, if you've got what it takes, you'll sponge and you'll figure things out from everyone else. Yeah. But I think for a lot of people, there's access to everything. If you really want to get better, jump on YouTube. Oh. Like, like all, half of Tom Panos's content is free. Half of Josh Vegan's content is free. Jump on podcasts, go and meet with other agents, speak yeah. with people. They're like, you can always learn something. You just have to surround yourself with the right people 
and what's going to work for you. Don't mirror everything you hear. Yeah. Like the amount of guys that you see go out there that, that they sound like they've just come straight from a training room. It's unbelievable. You've got to put your own spin on it. It's got to work for you. Yeah. And it's got to sound natural to your tone yeah. and who you are as a person. So I yeah. think that was like that's definitely a big thing. So it was just, yeah, that was that was the initial role, cold calling, all that sort of stuff. And then from there, someone had quit. Real estate's high turnover. Yeah. So there was always someone quitting, which was good. It kept opening doors for me. I just yeah. made sure I was right there knocking yeah. when they were leaving. So yeah. it was, he'd resigned. I moved into leasing. I learned a lot about the leasing role. Um, again, loved it. Loved the idea of closing deals. And that, that's what that was, you know, bringing rentals, like people through properties, yeah. trying to provide a next level of service. And then from there, it was just bits and pieces, you know, helping out around the office, doing anything, like I said. And then, um, business development after that. Yeah. That is honestly, any guy or girl who says, I want to be a sales agent one day, yes. if there is an opportunity in your office to become a business development manager, 100% yep. you should take that hands down. Yep. Before a PA role, yep. before a sales associate role, yep. that is such a good role. And, and why? Like, okay, why so why for two years, I had the opportunity, the free reign to speak to anyone in the database, yes. to build up my own database within, you know, within the offices. Because no one's threatened contacts. by you. No one's threatened by you. One hundred percent. So you then get free reign. They then allow you to come along to their open homes. They include you in things like come to a market appraisal because you're the business development manager. Yeah. They're going to want to know what it rents for. Yeah. So be smart with it. So I would make sure I'd say to every single agent before they go out, hey, you know, it's a great point of difference is if I come out and give you that rental appraisal so the client doesn't feel like you've got commission breath and that it's all just about, oh, you, you know, you're listing your house today, can I sign it up? Yeah. I can come in from the rental point of view. Yeah. We can, we can gel well yeah. and see what comes of it from there. Then it was rental appraisals for every single property. It was yeah. you know showing up to every single open home, meeting as many people as I could. But then in that process, what are you doing? You're signing up um, new business. Yeah. In signing up business, a rental agency agreement is no different to an agency agreement. You're still getting someone to commit to something that you know they're gonna have questions about. So you're learning how to deal with objection early. Yeah. Then you don't get paid on those until they're leased. Right, so it's about learning how to then find a buyer as such yes. for that particular property. So bringing someone in and closing a deal. So it just became a smaller version of what I'm doing now. No different. A lot of prospecting, yep. um, a lot of lot of buyer appointments, which were you know tenants appointments, yep. um, a lot of landlord communication, that sort of stuff to try and close a deal. And so that for me was so much better than than having maybe working alongside a sales associate because a lot of the times, like I said before. Working alongside me is going to be good, but you're not going to get as much as you will working on your own doing something like that because there's a lot of stuff I'm not going to let go. Yeah. And a lot of stuff that, like I'm not going to let someone else do the buy negotiation, so how are they ever going to learn yes, when they do it themselves? Yes. So I reckon for me that was probably a big thing. Um, then after the two years in BDM, moved into sales. Yep. That was, as I said, that was a fight. That was like, you know. A real fisty cuff to get there because I, I wanted to be there so bad. So it was having that conversation with the principal about that I'm ready. And I, I think now, in hindsight, I can understand. I can understand his hesitation because yep. you can easily break your spirit jumping into sales too early. Yes. You know, you can just get crushed. And it is so competitive, especially where we work, like Terrigal. As I said before, there's 70 to 70 to 100 agents who have listed or sold something in Terrigal over the last 12 months. That's a competitive space. So there's a couple of key agents and core agents in that area, but there's everyone trying to take one or two, one or two. Yeah. And that's what kills you, because it becomes hard. You wouldn't mind if it was just an area where there was five or six dominant agents who picked up the stock and you know you know if you lose one, it's to your competitor. Yeah. When you start losing it to out of area agents, oh, okay. when you were never a look in or a chance, that's when it starts to get really frustrating. Yeah. So I'd ended up moving into, um, into sales. Yeah. Tim gave me a run at that. And I just, as I said, I, I very process driven, had the goal of 350 and I thought, oh, okay, I'm gonna get there no matter what. So I made the commitment to be there six days a week. Yep. Did everything that that, that that took, late hours, early mornings. And it wasn't just, again, about being in the office. It's about making sure you're productive when you're there. Yes. So went through all of that. After three months, I was getting on a bit of a roll. Had a couple of listings. I think I got my first listing after two weeks of being in sales. And for, for anyone who knows me, they know I talk a lot about like listing karma. Yep. I'm a big believer that in this industry, you can make all the calls you're supposed to make yes. and you'll get this from it. Yes. Absolutely nothing. Like I would sit there and I'd make 100 calls and I'd go, oh, you'd be you know, so frustrated and you'd go, how's that happen? I've just made 100 calls, not one market appraisal, not one talk of a listing, not one person saying they're gonna sell. Yep. That's just madness. And you, you can be so frustrated by it that it really can, I suppose, put you off making the next bunch of calls. Yes. But for me, it was just about, I knew early on to stick to it. And it would be that you'd make those 100 calls, then a call in would come to the office. Right, so my first listing made 
tons of calls that week. Yeah. Like just in the office all the time, always on the phone. You know, I had Tim walking past going, mate, you're doing really well, doing really well. And in my head, I'm going, mate, I haven't even booked a market place. What are you talking about? <laughs> you know, and you're going, oh, what am I going to do? I'm not getting to the end of this week without something. So you even start doing everything, direct mail, emails, whatever. I'd sent out this one email and just kept working away and working away. Yep. And I remember I'd made about 80 connects, which that, yep. that's a huge day for me. There's, yeah, there's not yeah. many days, I, I, even now I probably- In one day? In one day, that's that was a huge day. Huge. And like, as I said, I'm not someone who sits there and, and pumps up all of these numbers. Most times I'd probably make 25 connects yep. to, you know, to, to people I don't know. I'll, I'll do hundreds of calls throughout the day to people you do know, you know what it's like. The phone doesn't stop, you're always on the phone with something. Yep. But to people I don't know and actually, you know, try and engage things, there, there might be 25 to 50 connects on average, yep. as good as it gets. So this was a big day. And at the end of the day, nothing had nothing packing up getting ready to go home and I was like man this sucks this sucks I don't know if I could get used to this just coming in and just like you know that your day's starting you're just gonna get defeated by the phone yeah. you're just gonna be told to piss off no one wants to speak to you getting nothing out of it five minutes later I get this email back from this lady she says Matt timely email we actually want to sell that place can you send us through an agency agreement and I was like this is surely some sort of sick joke. Yeah. So I wrote back and back and forth over that, just that night, she was, she was in Canada and I stayed up all night, Pick, picked up the business that night, got my first listing with my first week of sales and I went, oh, this is easy, all it is is energy. Just put the energy in and it comes back. So for me, that's what I just focused on. Yeah. Just no matter what, it's listing karma. You're gonna do the right things, it's not always gonna to come to something straight away. You're not always gonna get things, but you know, sometimes just putting in the energy, that's when things start to come your way and it starts to open doors for you. So awesome. that was what I tried to do and really focus on. Yep. And uh, so I got into sales, went through that role. Yep. After like a pretty good start, yep. I think I had three or four listings in the first two to three months, yep. which like I was happy with. It was sort of in line with where I needed it to be numbers wise. Yep. Um, Tim, our principal, he just lost his assistant. And he was like, oh, I can't do it. And he's, he's old school. Like he doesn't even know how to use a computer very well. <laughs> so he's like, what am I gonna do? And I said, well, this sounds like a you problem, yeah, yeah. you know? And then I could just sense it. You know, he's just prodding at me. He's just daily just going, oh, I'm, I'm so stuck. I'm so stuck, I don't know what I'm gonna do. And I went, the on button? <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh mate, yeah. mate, he, he's just turning it up big time. Oh mate, does anyone know how to turn these computer screens on? You know, he's just playing at big town. And, and I thought, oh, I'll just have to help. And as I said, that like that's my personality. I, I really love to try and give back, to try and help people. And I thought, you know what, let's just help. He's, he gave me the job, it's the least I can do. Yeah. So I, I approached him and said, look, it's not what I want to do. I want to be my own agent, I want to be my own man, but I'll come and help you and I'll work with you. You just tell me what you need me to do. So that was everything all the way through from admin yeah. um, to you know open home callbacks. Yes, it was a great opportunity to work alongside the principal and to, to, you know, to meet some of the people that he might know and whatever else, but I think what a lot of people don't realise that when you work alongside someone like that, who is such a big name, sometimes you can, you know, you can let yourself get a bit outshadowed and you can get comfortable yeah. in a role where you may be getting some commission from a lot of the principal's deals. Yep. It can be so easy to lose focus about prospecting and, and sticking to your game plan, yeah. becoming your own agent. So I'd made myself a rule that although money was tight and real estate really wasn't paying well at the start, mm -hmm. I, said, I said, well, long game. I'm going to get more being my own agent than I am being Tim's assistant. Yeah. So I just made the call and I said, mate, I'll do this for six to nine months. That's it. Yep. Look, the benefits were got my name on a couple of extra listings, yep. got my name in the paper, gave me confidence. But you know what I learned out of all of it? It was just how to juggle. Because, yeah. mate, I reckon compared to most agents, like I've got an assistant now, but I could still run at the same pace I am now. It's just that I wanted the service to increase is why I, I took that next step. It wasn't so much that I couldn't handle it because yep. I could handle it. You know, you can throw 40 to 60 listings at me and I'm confident that I can do it and still do it at the same pace. The only, you know, the only person who might disagree or get frustrated with that would probably be my girlfriend. <laughs> She'd sit at home going, get off the phone, yeah. come inside and have dinner. <laughs> and this is about nine at night, so yeah. understandably. But for me, it's, that's what I learned, is learning how to deal at like high volume, high pace yeah. with clients who had higher expectations because a lot of the stock that he deals in is around that two and a half, three million dollar mark, yeah, right. where mine was 600, 700,000, I thought, Imagine if I could take that same level of service for that stuff where, you know, professional brochures, everything done just to that absolute next level, a copywriter who writes these great texts about the property, dusk shoots for things. Yeah. In that six to 700 mark where I work in Terrigal, that just wasn't a thing. People just don't do that. It's just like, it's just seen as the bottom end stock. And I thought, you know what? I don't want to be a generalist to the point where I'm listing properties in, you know, in say, um, 
in Tugra and then across in Nora Head and then you know back to all different areas. I just want to stick to one core suburb. I don't want to list in Gosford and Lizard and whatever. I'll do bits and pieces as they come up for relationships, yep. but I won't go out there and take something cold. I won't take a lead that, that I just know that there's no point in being out there. Yep. I decided I wanted to specialise in just terrible. Yes. How long ago was it that decision that you made that? First first week, first listing yeah, was in well, Terrigal. Yeah. Got that listing and I went, it was on a main road in Terrigal and I thought, gosh, Terrigal's the sort of market and the sort of area. It's quite a clicky, well-connected area. Yep. Everybody kind of knows everyone. It's yep. still got that like country, beach town yeah, sort of feel. Okay. So I'd rather just saturate one particular area than have one street in every single suburb across the coast be a household name. Yep. Why not just stick to what, like one area? So, you know, there's times where I will take on stuff that might be you know, like when I say Terrigal, it's predominantly Terrigal. I'll do a couple in Wanbul, a couple in North of Oka and areas like that. Definitely love the business in those areas because they're still 2260. That's still our postcode. That's still yeah, where okay. I live and breathe. But it's when you start getting further afield, anything that's like 30 to 45 minutes away, that you know it's hard to give away because you know that it's commission. Yep. Sometimes it's uncontested. And they're like, Matt, we want to list with you because we've got a relationship. We've met you before. We've been to your open home, whatever. And you have to try and figure out, is it going to be worth the attention that you're going to give that in a different suburb that's going to take you away from Terry Law or take yeah. you away from your core area. So I learned pretty quickly to, to try and balance that and juggle it. So I recently you know, picked up a couple of listings that I knew were in a core area of another agent yep. that I had a relationship with. Yep. Benefits of working with a big brand, yeah. you can work in with everyone. So I made the agreement was that I'd sign them up and I'll give him 50% of it, but he was to run it and we were to run everything together. But that way I didn't have to get stuck doing the open homes and driving 40 minutes and then 40 minutes back. Yeah. Yeah. So that that was that was the process. Awesome.